starting, Matthew. So, um, well, we have, I'm hugely, like, honoured, to be honest, honoured oh, and oh, delighted oh. <laughs> to have none other than Dr. David Allenson with us uh, here for the fifth instalment of uh, Matthew Vlogs. And uh, hello, David, it's lovely to see you as always. <laughs> Hi Matthew, uh, glorious anyone, to see you. I feel as though anyone who doesn't know you uh, is is worse off in their life, to be honest. <laughs> um, so today, uh, the whole point about this is to talk about um, snobbery in, uh, in in classical music. And this all came about because I just decided to have a little bit of talk about it at the end of my last vlog, and then I thought, this not only is an interesting, very interesting subject, but also thought I am not qualified to uh, talk about this in a very rounded and full way. So hence, you are here. Now, for anyone who doesn't know you, um, or I should say that David and I are, uh, are sharing beers. Yes, I think. Cheers. Good health. Yes, cheers. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know you, it would be great if you could just give a brief resume of your um, your uh, brief I say David because I'm sure you could go on for hours uh, a brief yeah. about your musical um, qualifications. Oh bless you Matthew oh, thank you for having me it's brilliant to see you brilliant to share a beer and talk about music um, I am uh, a musician who lives in Kent um, I conduct uh, for a living now uh, I used to be a director of music at the local university in Canterbury um, and I'm a singer and a conductor. I used to teach at Bristol, which is how we met, Bristol University. Yeah. I've held teaching posts in Oxford colleges. So I feel I sort of sit on the on the crack between academic music teaching and practical music teaching. I'm now a freelancer and I go around uh, the country and around Europe when uh, the situation allows, conducting um, early music mainly, but all sorts. I love choir training above all. And I work with l l levels from amateur to professional. So I, I see. So both really, sides. you've seen you've seen snobbery in in very many different uh, mediums, really. I suppose I have, <laughs> uh, which is which is great, excellent. Um, first of all, I suppose it's quite important to say that snobbery is, is is not limited to classical music, right? Okay, it's everywhere, uh, and in fact, in in our daily lives. So, what is snobbery? Yeah, what is snobbery? Well, in one sense, snobbery is people um, policing each other and judging yes. each other and setting the rules of how you're going to behave or um, be in a space or how you're going to treat art, um, you know, how you're going to listen, how you're going to look. Um, and it can feel, I think, sometimes as if uh, music particularly is prone to feeling like it's a club and you have to understand the rules and regulations of how to Which be inside you get that club. a lot, of course, in, in choirs, don't you, right? Okay. So very, very cliquey, and um, I think this is part of maybe the reason why it's so difficult to go into a choir, um, because it feels as though, you know, you're, you're, you're on the outside and, and they're all on the inside, you know? Yeah, so there's a mixture, isn't there? Because there's the social belonging aspect of a choir, and you, yep. there's often a cliquing as well, which goes on in groups, which isn't the same Absolutely. as snobbery, but it's just um, how do you become a person who's welcomed and comfortable? Um, I think the other thing is that with music, there's because you have to learn the skill, there's often a sense that you're not quite good enough, that you've um, perhaps you were told as a kid that you by the teacher to pipe down, or you, it, you walk into the room and you're intimidated by people who are excellent, and you think, well, I can never do that. I've been thinking about snobbery. I think one of the... Um, things that feeds into it actually is insecurity on the part of people where actually they they um they put themselves down so they think um oh i'm not good enough to be in this space or i shouldn't be here or i can't do this and i think that can also alter how people behave because when people feel defensive um and as if they might be found out they actually become much more brittle i think about and more um sometimes a bit more aggressive i've encountered that in choirs as well so straight away then, there, there's a perception issue, maybe. <laughs> um, so uh, as you say, maybe if, if you don't feel good enough um, or um, you feel as though, oh no, this, this isn't accessible to, to, yeah. to someone like me, uh, which is created by that, well, we're here and uh, no, sorry, but um, yeah. I, I don't think so. You, you, you stay out there. You know? Part of that is what people want music to be to them. 
and then finding their own failings get in the way so they, they can then become a bit disillusioned with it and then they can put the blame somewhere else which can lead to a sort of snippy rudeness it's not the same as snobbery i think a lot of what we're talking about really is decorum so it's, it's oh. how it's how you should be um, in a space and other people, as I say, sort of policing it. I often think classical well, those, music... Those two are kind of, those two are kind of intrinsically linked though, aren't they? Yeah. Really, I, I'm not sure you can actually separate those two really. No. And above all, because music's a social phenomenon, you can't, um, as we say, you can't detach it from the business of being in, in or out of a group. I think that's absolutely right. Yes, <laughs> so there is, there is, I suppose, um, and do have some beer, please. Yeah, uh, do, I, I'm worried about you. I'm worried that you're going to dehydrate. Oh no! Wait a minute. No, <laughs> alcohol's no good. That is it. Um, it's um, it's a bit like um, can you walk into to, to, to the Albert Hall uh, for prom number 162 uh, with your dreadlocks and your uh, your big uh, rock metal, um, you know. Uh, boots and, and and leather jacket and um uh it, yeah it's um I hope yeah, that, you can. it's very interesting i hope you can and i think actually the proms are probably one of the less snooty places yes uh, funny enough actually i i think you're right uh yeah. and last year it wasn't last year maybe it was actually the year before uh, myself and emily went to two proms um one of them to hear, to hear the rachman and off vespers um which was a wonderful of course, <clears throat> and others here is Shostakovich 10th Symphony. And I do remember uh, in one of those concerts actually seeing someone that would fit that description. <laughs> and you notice, of course, don't you, David? And actually, you don't want to notice. I think that's the thing. Yeah. But you can't help yourself but be like, oh. Yeah. So we've all internalized I, I, these things. And yes, I, 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 it wasn't like an, oh, for me, you shouldn't be here. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was actually like, oh, that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> yes. you, you, you know, while, I, while everyone else is there with their suits and, oh, look, you know, look at me and oh, la -di -da, and yeah. I've just ordered my uh, £30 platter from the restaurant, you know. But I think one of the things about snobbery is you don't know what values you're invested in until somebody else breaks them. So um, it, right. it, there's no need to question it if everyone's dressed the same and everyone's quiet and everyone's hushed tones and white and middle class or whatever. As long as you're like, behaving, right, exactly. uh, David? As long but as you're it, behaving. Yeah. But, but actually, even if you come in and look different, even if you're behaving well, you can experience judgment. Um, yes. I, I think classical music is often a bit like the British Museum where um, a certain group of curators have decided what's of value and what goes in, inside that building. And I think certainly academically musicology has been struggling for the last 40 years with firstly things like early music that doesn't fit with the classical stuff. But my goodness, you know, the outrage, folk music, jazz, music by non-white people, music, music from all around the world and other cultures. And I think the initial reaction of musicology was to keep Beethoven and Mozart safe in their busts in the gallery, but to add a sort of temporary classroom arrangement on the back to see if, uh, to see whether these things were going to stick around, you know? And only what the reason, of course, um, the, the way that those things get into the museum is probably partly by changing who curates the museum um, wow. which is to say that people um, let in things which look like themselves or which relate to themselves. The difficulty. Do... Mm. Sorry, David. Sorry, I, I, I actually didn't mean to cut you across you. We have a slight delay, so yeah, yeah. these things what? are going to happen. <coughs> the only Do thing I think. Hey, go on. Yeah. That things like how, <laughs> do you think that things like classic FM help in that regard? Ah, ah there we are. Good. Yeah, good. I, I'm very much on the same the, the same page as you, uh, really, in, in, in that respect. So that's I, because I I'm an inverted snob. That's I'm an inverted snob, right? So I look down on classic FM for popular. Yeah, what's it like? Yeah, but, but that's a problem because, of course, lots of people absolutely adore it and get great pleasure from the gobbets that are picked out um, and become yeah, popular. But look, there's, there's only so many times that you can hear Furlis, uh in, in, in a week or uh, The Lark Ascending. Now, there's nothing wrong with The Lark Ascending. I, I love Vaughan Williams, but, uh, you know... Yeah, there's only so much you can cope with it. You know? Yeah, yeah. But the problem is, you see, that um, it takes real effort to... To, to get to know complicated, uh, you know, emotionally complex music. And it's, I think Classic FM goes more down the pop route, which is where, where a pop song is like a capsule of feeling that you get for three minutes. And it's intense and beautifully produced, and it reminds you of a moment in your life. Um, and I would say that 
we all need that as well. So sometimes you just want the burger, but sometimes you want the filet mignon. And frankly, it's more expensive and more complicated to appreciate. The the thing I would now, always... is that is is that snobbery there, David? What what you no, just said? It, it's about saying this is a high genre. It's elite and complicated, and this is for immediate popular consumption. And that's but elite yeah. and complicated in that that's what its intent was. Yes, but remember, right. the patronage is, is changed. So in the modern world, everything's available all the time and commercialism rules. But in the past, particularly before electricity and recording, um, you have, a, well, let's say in the 19th century, you've got a small a bourgeoisie that patronised classical music. Before that, in the 18th century and earlier, it's aristocrats and the church. And the thing is that um, before you get mass media and the mass propagation of music, um, then high culture is the preserve. That's the place where music is going to be looked after and curated and, um, you know, and, and appreciated. Where we live now, we're in an age where this has become tiniest thread in a massive tapestry of culture. And it's very hard for it to justify itself because it's not very commercial, because it's not instant. It's high art oh. and it's elite. The thing for me would always be, is it accessible and available to, to a person of any kind? So I would always strive for elite. I think it's great to stay elite. I think the example I'd give you would be um, the idea of an even song in a cathedral. Um, you know, it's it's odd the first time you to even song if you don't know yeah. what the service is or when you're supposed to stand up or whatever. But yes. and you might be bowled over by the repertoire. But there's no need to dumb anything down. It's a, of itself a poetic jewel. The music is intense and amazing. The architecture will blow you away. So the key is to have the doors open so anyone can come in as long as they're willing to enter that space in, in the spirit in which one needs to enter the space. Is, is, there, is there an issue here of people with classical music thinking, well, because <laughs> um, I, I suppose this is what I'm trying to get to about you saying, you, you know, it's, it's elite and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and when, when you say things like it's elite, um, is is there a chance of someone watching this and going, well, then it's not for me, and it's that is that is the, that is the wrong. Story. They're wrong, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> and I think this is really really an important thing to to, to to discuss because I I I I understand what you're saying, um, but I think there is, I think there's a danger area there where we start to talk about classical music takes concentration, um, and it takes. Um, and, and look, you're right, but um, and it does take more investment in uh, compared to if you're going to sit down um, and listen to a, a three-minute Beatles song. Okay, so I understand what you're saying, but that's not to say that what can be crammed into a three-minute Beatles song <laughs> isn't any less um, amazing um, or well-crafted <laughs> or well-structured than what can actually be in a one hour symphony, right? So <laughs> I think there is, I think there's a, there's a danger there, isn't there, almost, of saying, well, okay, you, to, to, to understand and appreciate classical music, you're gonna have to be able to sit down and concentrate and listen to it in a way, oh, well, you know, obviously it's not for me then, bye. And, uh, and off I go. And, do, do, do you know what I'm saying? I do, but I think they're different, I think they're different beasts. So I don't think they're comparable really. I think the Beatles song is a great example because it's underpinned by classical harmony and gorgeous lyrics and it's completely authentic of itself because it's of its time and it's of the people who made it. Um, the classical music, a symphony of an hour, does require more commitment because you can't afford to be like a teenager walking through the National Gallery chewing gum and listening to headphones. You actually need to turn your head and look at the painting, right? So if you want to engage with that, the richness of life is waiting for you, right? The, the thing is, um, there's a cultural cringe which goes on and you think of those kind of light-hearted BBC proms talks where they don't want to be too detailed and it's all so superficial that it falls exactly between the two stools that people who aren't interested in classical music weren't going to watch it anyway and people who know anything about it are irritated because it's too dumb for them and actually yes. there are times in your life when you need these things right so you don't have to run after the youth vote or um, a particular demographic you have to go this thing is amazing I am going to advocate and evangelize for it here it is and I'm, I'm not going to change it um, it's ready for you when you need it in your life you might not find it till you're 77 um, and that's the time you needed some Marla and that's fine the, the thing is Matthew, so, that, um, music deserves music deserves attention to be paid to it when it is 
um, intellectually complex, um, it expresses profound human emotions, it plums the depths and joys of a human experience, and the people who are making it for you have trained for their whole lives and were already about the best people of their generation. Right? None of that deserves to be uh, downplayed by a uh, demi attention, right? So you need to go into no, this okay, place. Fair enough. Yep, and the okay. other thing I'd say is for the people who've um, come to appreciate it, I think one of the reasons people are snobby is that they value it almost too highly. So they get to a point where they've caught the train into London, paid the babysitter, paid for a hotel, had a dinner, dressed up, uh, yes, and then yes. some job comes in and chats next to them or you know, people rustle or look at their phone. The reason they're so angry is that they're hoping to access the sublimity of experience and this earthly, boring, banal thing is happening next to them. And I so think... is that a case where it's not, it's not actually the person as such, David? It's the interruption. It's the. It's. I suppose if you want to, for lack of um, a better word, the disrespect. Um, yeah. There's there's a lack of understanding on the etiquette. So actually, that goes back to to, to, to what you were saying um, about um, you, you don't realise um, how how you feel about these things until someone comes and smashes <laughs> smashes those things apart. That's right. um, that's, right. so that, that's, that's, that's interesting, actually. That's very, that's very interesting. Yeah. So the other Play thing by I... the rules, and, and, you, uh, and you're welcome, but don't pay... But, so is, is snobbery actually about etiquette? Yeah, often. It's about policing other people. So what, right. what I was going to say is I think it's also often about um, a rather 19th century way of listening. Um, obviously, up, up to the early 19th century, composers took their own works around and interpreted them very freely and, and um, actually... List, said, right? Yeah, Liszt plays, makes up his own cadenzas, Mozart made his own cadenzas. There's a sense of the um, celebrity composer bringing you the music, which meant that it well, was alive. And of course, actually, just as a side point, you know with Liszt, David, um, that he was the first person to turn the piano the other way, right? So, uh, uh, so that people could, could see the hat, because of course he was an absolute showman. <laughs> and of course, what will, what will be maybe shocking uh, to anyone who's still listening after our rambling, <laughs> um, is that of course, uh, List, List was that showman and uh, the women in the audience did throw uh, you know, under uh, undergarments at at him, <laughs> which of course in those days were like small boat sails, so it <laughs> created quite a breeze as all those pin pinnies and things. But I, what I was going to say was that um, once the middle class gets into concert halls and there's this repertoire that builds up, um, there's a problem, which is that 19th century ideals of um, uh, the music being sublime and sort of sent through a genius brain in, from heaven. Um, as a text, like a fully formed text that you worshipped, this creates an enormous problem because it means that the surface of the music is almost sacrosanct. So the performers are not so much owning the music like Liszt would have been or Mozart, who can change stuff around because they wrote it. They're actually just transmitters or um, conduits of genius, right? Even the conductors do. The conductor represents Beethoven and uh, waves his, you know, arms and his hair flies about. And what people, st the way people project this idea of genius means that um, they start to worship the work and the composer more than they do the, the uh, moment with the performers. And that means that you don't want to get in the way of Beethoven's genius, which you're going to take down like cod liver oil, because even though you don't like it that much, it's really morally very good for you. And I think that the middle class treat art sometimes a bit like tablets of stone from Moses, you know? And, and therefore, if other people come into the space who um, don't share the same decorum of behavior, and it would be things as simple as dress, as we've said, it might be bodily movement as well. So audiences are very still, and they dress in a sort of sober way. And if someone comes in and they're, mo and they're going, this music's amazing, and they start to feel it in their body, that would be totally inappropriate in a Northern European Protestant culture. I mean, yeah. a Protestant inheritance that we have. Whereas yes. I'm sure you've experienced it as I have. If you go to the South of Europe, audiences are much more inclined to become physically engaged with music and to be demonstrative oh, in the space, right? And I mean, I've had Italians um, shout at, uh, from the pews, dance. I had a woman walk her dog through the middle of a concert. There was a kind of mixture of casualness and emotion, which I found shocking and also exhilarating because it contradicted yes. and thrilled me. 
because it's naughty. Yes. Yeah? It's, 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 it's very interesting, and I know I've told you this story, so I, I, you know it's not going to be very interesting for you, but this story that I told you about, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Heisman's creation uh, and the premiere performance and the heavens are telling, and uh, you get this ascending um, sequence, and, um, uh, and everyone at that point stood up and started just spontaneous applause. Um, 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 so all I'd say to that, Matthew, me, can I say something about that? Is it... Well, in a second, yes. Okay, okay. And part of me thinks it's just me. I have your, have your lager. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you drink your beer with your little. Uh, your I little didn't thing. even notice, Matthew. That was... <laughs> like a cup of tea. But <laughs> <laughs> um, part of me thinks. It's a shame that we've lost that. I mean, look, you know, we're both conductors, except you're actually a conductor, and I'm, I'm a fraud, really. But, um, you know, the, the reality of something like that happening during a performance now, um, I get frustrated if, if you hear someone just whispering in the background. Mm. So the, the, the idea of that happening now, it, it, it's just hard to comprehend. Uh, uh, and I suppose, ideally, you, you do want people to wait mm. to the end um, and yet part of me also thinks it's, it's a shame that we've lost it um, and I actually I think back to a concert uh, with Bridge and Tabernacle <laughs> um, and um, we um, it's the summer concert where we have the orchestra and um, I'd done all the program notes <laughs> and I think my program notes were quite good. <laughs> and um, in that concert, because we have the orchestra, we always do something that is just with the orchestra. Um, and actually, we did a little um, Malcolm Arnold suite. Oh, uh, I don't know if you know them, David, but some of the Malcolm Arnold suites, they're very short, but they're really mm. fantastic. Mm. Uh, and there's three, three movements, total in about 10 minutes. Uh, we finished the first movement and everyone in the audience started clapping. Um, and at the end of the second movement, mm -hmm. um, and as much as I thought, you know, cretins, you know, basically. <laughs> you know, right? Well, let um, it out, let it out, Matthew. Well, but, well, because, yes, but if we're going to be honest, there is a part of you that does think, what, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. You know? You're not supposed to do that. Part of me also thought, they enjoyed it. Yeah. They wanted to clap. That's right. Why not? Yeah. They're showing appreciation. And I think um, you're right. Well, it depends on the kind of audience that you're serving. But it is a yes. game, you see, and they didn't know the rule. And the rule was no. they're not supposed to clap. But, I mean, how awkward is it actually sometimes to have a gloriously um, exhilarating allegro movement and then for it to end into silence and everyone has to gather themselves for the slow movement. And actually, the applause would have really released some tension. And, Absolutely. And it would have captured the moment, whereas 15 minutes later, your reward for that little bit of thrilling stuff is evaporated. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, so many times I've been to a concert and you get to the end of a, a movement and you just sit there and you just think, wow, you know, and you do literally just want to be like, that was like, yeah. <laughs> but no, you, you've got to. And I actually, <laughs> yes, in, the, in, in a sense, that's kind of a shame that you can't do it at that point, but by the time you've got to the end, mm. you've, you've, lost, you've lost that moment that was just right. nice and encapsulated. I'm That's not right. sure what this has to do with snobbery, but... <laughs> no, it has a lot to do because you would have hissed or booed at somebody next to you in the audience who decided to clap. And they would have been left alone and then they would have been shamed. And that's what snobbery is, is shaming. Yeah. Um, ah. so, I mean, it, I, I would say that it's very, very important to pay attention to musicians work as I said earlier you're often listening to the elite of the elite playing wonderful stuff the other thing is if it's an amateur group they probably spent six ten twelve weeks learning that thing and they've worked their socks off well let's pay attention actually and and let's hear what they've got to say and the thing yeah. is that um the other the other thing is that it's selfish if you don't conform so I think snobbery can be a positive force if there's somebody who decides that they want to emotionally engage with the music and see and tell the world how they feel in a room full of other people, then actually they're prioritizing their own need to vent their feeling over the communal experience. And that therefore the silence is respect for other people to have their own private experience and for them to yeah. consider what their reaction is to that piece of music. Because the moment you fill the space with a shout or an applause or a you know movement, actually you've deprived them 
you've drawn attention to that person and you've deprived the person of their own private communion with the music. And, and yeah. this, this is one of the things about listening, I think. Listening in groups, listening in a crowd, is different to listening at home or listening to a record or listening yeah. to rehearsal. There's an intensity to that which builds up. And one of the things the audience, I think, often doesn't realise is that their um, quality of attention and listening changes the performance. And it can be very um, electrifying to perform to a group of um, members of the public who've come off the street and decide to give you their fullest attention. And actually silence can be very thick and applause can be very meaningful. And the kind of music that you get out of people changes according not only to the architecture, but to the ears that the music's going into and the brains it's meeting. Oh, and, I think, yeah. and I think that that's, um, audiences don't realize that they're a dynamic partner in, in music making. And I've found that the choirs can quite transform actually against an audience which is listening clearly with, and they might be eyes shut, they might be crying. I mean, if it's really That's great. Yes, yeah. um, so I think the Very interiority true. of listening is important. And, and if you do let it all out, then I think in a sense, you um, di not only disrespect the work, which is the traditional thing to say, but you can be disrespecting the um, immense um, talent and um, effort that's been put in by the people who you've um, here. Was it, playing Devil's Advocate now, which is one of my favourite games, um, yeah. was it disrespectful to the work to show that at the time the List was doing his... Yeah. Right, so is that only because he was alive? Yeah, I mean, as what... soon as he died, did it then become a disrespectful thing? Um, so it's about what culture says is right. Because we all live in, because music is a shared social experience, I think, and it, all of us exist within a culture. So um, I think now we've we've got to the point where the work is worshipped and we sit in silence. And, and now we've tried to break that, which audiences constantly do with their outreach programmes and their youth concerts and their relaxed programmes where people can move and talk or um, concerts for nursing mums or whatever. That's all great. Right. Because what they're saying is we're going to break this down, but we'd quite like you to come up to the place where we really give it 100% the gold star concert, which probably is where you need to sit and listen. But but please come on up. And I think that's, that's great. Um, but oh, I think you're right. So in a Handel opera, for example, um, it would play to the same group of aristocratic patrons until they didn't come to the theatre anymore. So there might be 18, 20 performances in the, as you probably know, there were dinners being served by servants in the boxes. Yeah. There were ladies of the night wandering around. There was gambling. There was drinking. People, I'm so sorry, everyone. There were people <laughs> um, shouting at their favourite um, singer and booing the ones they didn't like. There'd be donkeys coming across the stage. Again, undies flying towards, often towards the castrati. And, and I think, I mean, you know, you know, there's that woman, she screams, um, one God, one Farinelli, and then she passes out at his feet, you know? Anyway. I think, so So what I'd say is now if you go to a Handel opera seria, which lasts about three and a half hours and is full of impenetrable Greek gods and Roman gods marching about doing things you don't care about, but the music's sublime, everyone sits in absolute silence. There's no dinner, no gambling, no drinking, and certainly no naughty, you know. So um, that means that the opera is being paid attention to in a way that Handel never imagined it would be. Right, they no. He understood that whole tracts of it would disappear under a tide of, of inattentive people chatting and shouting and eating. So, in which, a way... Which actually, to be fair, no composer would want, right? Let, let's be honest. Well, not yeah. now, but that's because of, we've got a different idea that... I mean, this is tied up with the idea that the composer has something to say all the time, that they've got some profundities to unleash. The thing is that oh, Handel yeah. does... But Handel's, Handel's very much serving his patrons, and he understands that um, his polite place in the world. This is something I really wanted to say to you about snobbery as well. One of the reasons I think musicians dress up in, you know, traditionally in bow ties or penguin suits, is that there's this master-servant relationship between them and the audience all the time. The, the musician is always the servant of the audience, who have paid them to, uh, paid to listen to them, um, the That's choir has often paid you to be their master, right? Now, the, yes. Actually, let's focus on that relationship because I have this as well. I'm constantly aware of the fact that they've asked, the, the group of singers have asked me to boss them around for a day or a year or whatever. Um, and yet they're paying my salary and they can unappoint me if they don't like it. And mm. I think that there's this tension between who is in charge and what you get as a conductor say is you're in artistic charge, but you're there by um, permission to boss the group around, which ultimately could withdraw your money or withdraw your position. And I think similarly with the audience, 
Um, the audience is your master because they paid for the tickets and you need the money. But they've also come to worship at your feet because of your skill. And the thing that you give them, of course, is emotion and feeling. So there's a complicated Amazing. transaction going on in the room. Absolutely. And, and I think, think about how you dress for this. And I think you'll find that um, it's you that's the waiter and then that's the diner. So yes. it's you that's in the penguin suit and them that's sitting down in, this, in the seat. Um, and that makes you the lesser person, except when you're transmitting... Um, euphonious glories which reveal you know the, the great spiritual world or, or the sublime and suddenly the audience needs what you've got and that's your gift uh, to show emotion and uh, you know and, and human human experience that's, that, that's, that, that, that's i mean that's genuinely fascinating concepts as, as a conductor well as a pseudo conductor um look I, i'm realizing that we've been talking for quite a while so it's, uh, I, i'd like to try to sort of try to, to sort of um wind it up <laughs> um and um i think really for me um one one of the things that i'd love to just talk about briefly um is you know, we, we have the snobbery, and the snobbery leads to this idea of classical music only as something that is acceptable to, you know, a, a certain, you know, shaped box for that, you know, lack of any, uh, any better phrase. And if you're a circle trying to get through a square peg, uh, mm -hmm. then it's just tough luck, right? Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I've been trying to think how... how how do we uh, how do we make classical music more accessible? It's very interesting to hear about those things um, that, that you were saying about the more sort of informal concerts, uh, and that's great. But actually, I think really there is a more fundamental issue, um, and really that goes right back to when is when and how is classical music introduced? Mm -hmm. right? uh, it's got to go right back to the source. Now, for myself, <laughs> I think. Um, it was joining the church choir. <coughs> okay, mm. so joining the church choir, uh, and that's um, what. Oh, God, Hello. Sorry. That's what introduced me yeah. uh, to it. Okay, and obviously my parents being musical. Okay, um, so I think it's it's having that experience, but I think crucially. It is as important as it is to have music in schools. I think it's important that we try to reach people actually outside of the school um, and within the community and find, try to find some way to engage, especially the younger generation in a community uh, setting to say, this is something that actually you can come to and it is relevant. And the easiest example, of course, which I've said to you before is, for example, film music, the genius that is John Williams, uh, whether you like the film music or not, mm. um, that, you know, his ability to do this fantastic pastiche composition. Uh, and so for anyone who doesn't know that, effectively writing music that sounds like something else that's been written. Uh, and so John Williams, um, you know, there's plenty of stuff in Star Wars where you can go and listen to a piece of Debussy and it will sound very, very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's an opportunity to say there to the kids, you know, let's watch this scene from Star Wars, uh, listen to the music and they'll go, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then say, oh, well, did you actually know it's based on this piece of Debussy? Oh, oh no, I didn't. OK, let's see what else there is. And, and, and suddenly it becomes something that's relevant. And mm -hmm. I think that's... That's yes. the key as well. Yes. You know, and it's context, right, David? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think people are surrounded by classical music and they don't realise it. And it's, yes. it's in every TV programme and advert as well. But yes, of course, film scores with their big budget, they often employ a full orchestra. And you're right, there's a heck of a lot of back referencing going on to the late 19th century and early 20th century. I think the other thing um, is schooling, how, how kids are introduced to music, both in the school and out in the community. I think there's been a great death of active cultural engagement in this country. Um, so to do with, um, you know, uh, the age of TV and then the age of Internet and just this idea that, um, oh, Matthew, have you frozen up? Uh, oh, I've frozen. Oh, you froze, but I'm going to keep talking. Yep. So, um, uh, just, just a second. Am I, am I back? He's back. He's back. Sorry, yeah. So I was going to say the passivity of culture is a huge problem because people don't, for example, for singers, they don't realise they can sing. They consume it passively through, um, you know, through the media. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, um, 
uh, around education is it, it's increasingly sadly I think retreating backwards from an age of um, you know music centres, cheap music lessons, free instruments to try. I think we're moving back towards a social stratification where music goes back to being the preserver of people either who, who have families already involved in music or have the wealth to think that this is a great extra thing because if you're not so well off and you don't know about music then you probably don't get your child involved and that's a problem if it becomes a class possession again because it reduces the, the pool of talent that's going into music and the, the final thing but of I'd course say it's something that i'm always very aware of as, as a private piano tutor um you know i can only teach to people to that, that can afford it um and that's a, a sad reality really yes Yes. Um, but also, it's a it's an understandable necessity for me. I, I can't teach yeah. on tiered systems, uh, you know. Which is why I mean, I was one of the last generation, probably, of children where you could have a violin to try for nothing. The lessons cost nothing at the beginning. Um, you get an ear test, and you're given an instrument to try. My parents weren't musical, and you know, because I got ninety nine percent on the ear accuracy, they went, "You probably should try this." I think the, yes. the only other, other thing I was going to say was that um, we mentioned the kind of Italian Spanish example earlier. In Italy, um, there's a much um, noticeably much less of a division between popular and classical, and opera arias are much more known as just like folk songs, and so oh, yeah. it's. I think it's self-perpetuating because the British are snobs anyway and the English much more than the Welsh or the Scots and the Northern Irish. So the Southern English most of all. And if you get this toxic combination of social climbing, schools, wealth, and then um, in, the, in and out groups and music's tangled up in that um, mixture of hierarchies, then you've got a big problem. And um, yeah. all of us, that's where the insecurity comes from because we don't always feel... Um, even if we're perfectly entitled to be there, um, as if we belong in that space or in that group, and we don't know how to behave with that thing. And it's insecurity that tells on us, and it's other people's judgment that tells on us. And I think that's, the, uh, that's what snobbery is. But I hope that during this discussion, it's also suggested that snobbery can be a force for good because um, it can be a way of regulating behaviour in relation to very, very um, fine things, the best humanity can make. And actually, um, if you join that club and come into the space, you too can experience the sublimity of that experience. So I'm, I'm standing up for it a little bit, yeah? All right, okay. Well, that, that seems like a very, very nice way to finish off, actually. Uh, thank you ever so much, uh, oh. Dr. <laughs> David. Such a uh, pleasure. Yes, mine's, mine's actually gone. Yours probably <laughs> isn't halfway through, right? I was so, nervous about <laughs> what I'd say, yeah. Um, it's honestly genuinely uh, such a fascinating conversation. I think there's so much more to be said on that. Um, but I, 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 yes, I think we could talk for several hours on this. But uh, th honestly, thank you so much. Um, and I, I really find it so interesting. Oh, me too. Um, and uh, I would de definitely have you back again, maybe for the um, the, the, the um, compositional genius of Elton John. But yes, um, please. We'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we'll leave that for another session. And and thank you so much, David, for uh, for joining in on Matthew Vlogs. Thank you. That's an enormous honour. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Best Thanks, David. All the best. Thanks so Bye. much. Bye-bye.